Early in the morning, on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone was moved away from the entrance. She ran at once to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, breath breathlessly panting. They took the master from the tomb. We don't know where they put him. Peter and the other disciple left immediately for the tomb. They ran neck and neck. The other disciple got to the tomb first, outrunning Peter. Stooping to look in, he saw the pieces of linen cloth lying there, but he didn't go in. Simon Peter arrived after him, entered the tomb, observed the linen cloths lying there and the kerchief used to cover his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but separate, neatly folded by itself. Then the other disciple, the one that had gotten there first, went into the tomb, took one look at the evidence and believed. No one yet knew from the scripture that he had to rise from the dead. The disciples went back home, but Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. As she wept, she knelt to look into the tomb and saw two angels sitting there dressed in white, one at the head and the other at the foot of where Jesus' body had been laid. They said to her, woman, why do you weep? They took my master, she said, and I don't know where they put him. After she said this, she turned away and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't recognize him. Jesus spoke to her, woman, why do you weep? Who are you looking for? She, thinking that he was the gardener, said, mister, if you took him, tell me where you put him so that I can care for him. Jesus said, Mary, turning to face him, she said in Hebrew, Rabbani, meaning teacher. Jesus said, don't cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go to my brothers and tell them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went, telling the news to the disciples, I saw the Master. And she told them everything he said to her. Just outside the walls of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, the most cosmic event in all of human history, all of the universe's history took place. That Jesus, the creator of the universe, was crucified on a cross. And yet three days later, the stone was rolled away, came back to life and walked out of the tomb. Jesus, the Son of God both human and divine, died on a cross. The earth darkened on that Good Friday between noon and 3 p.m. There was an earthquake. The rocks were ripped open. It's as though heaven and earth had collided for a moment when Jesus was crucified. But this three days later, this Easter Sunday, another earthquake, Jesus resurrected walked out of the tomb the whole world order was forever changed every person who wants to can now have a relationship with God for themselves it was a mad few moments angels start appearing Christianity was born the world was never the same again the magnitude of the story when you reflect on it for a moment it, it, it almost blows our mind that God himself would choose to die and God himself would be resurrected on our planet in the midst of all of the billions of planets to express something to our world of his absolute love and commitment. So you can think of it on a cosmic level if you want. The universe was changed 2,000 years ago. But interestingly, when you read the gospel stories, it's a far more intimate story than that. Often when I preach on Easter Sunday, I like to look at the character of Peter. But I want to look at the adventure of Mary Magdalene on this day, and Tina read from that a little bit. This lady, Mary was one of Jesus' most faithful followers. She's actually mentioned 12 times in the Gospels, more than most of the apostles, actually. And we find her in the Gospels long before Easter week. So this is the lady that was searching for him and he confronted. 
outside that garden tomb. But we find her earlier in the Gospels. This is where we first find her in Luke 8. Jesus continued according to the plan, traveling from town after town, village after village, preaching God's kingdom, spreading the message. The 12 were with him. Jesus already had his followers by this time. The disciples were part of the crew. They're on the team. There were also some women in the company who had been healed of various evil afflictions and illnesses. Mary, the one called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. This lady had met Jesus and he transferred her life a while before this Easter weekend that we read about. Then we find her again at the cross on Good Friday. While the soldiers were looking after themselves, Jesus' mother, his aunt, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene stood at the foot of the cross. The blokes had all gone. These are the remaining people at the cross. She's one of those who'd been healed by him a while earlier, had seen him crucified. And she goes looking for him on Easter Sunday morning. She was one of these followers of Jesus, and you find numbers of them throughout the scriptures that were tro- truly devoted to him. That, that she'd centered her whole life around this rabbi that they called Jesus because he had given her a second chance of life. She was so committed to him because she got a fresh start that she was yearning for. Jesus still loves to give second chances. It's like his speciality. She had been radically transformed by his healing power. She was like overwhelmingly grateful to him. His presence, she stayed close I reckon because something of his presence kept her anxiety at bay. The second chance was real. The demons aren't coming back. Life's going to be okay as long as I'm close to Jesus. Is how she'd lived her life in recent times. Those of us that are already Christians will know something of this experience that he comes into our lives. We meet him, whether as a child or an adult, it doesn't matter, but something grips our heart and we realize if we stay close to him and focused on him, then life seems to do okay because he is with us. And then sometimes we drift because of our distractions or our agendas. And then we realize Jesus isn't quite so close and life starts to unravel. She'd learned this lesson. As long as I stay close to him, it's going to be all right. It's not me making life all right. He's God, I'm not. He's the one who can look after me. He stopped her life from unraveling. He was her rock. But then on Good Friday, he died. The one who she'd put all her hope in died on a cross now we know the story and even if this is your first time in church you'll have heard different bits at school and whatever you know that the christian story is one of jesus coming back you'll know that much if nothing else and 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 that's absolutely fine but you see back for the early church at the beginning of history nobody was expecting jesus to come back he told them he's coming back none of them knew he was coming back they just didn't get it because dead people usually stay dead they just didn't get it so when she went to the tomb, she wasn't, she wasn't looking for a risen Jesus. She was looking to anoint his body. She was, she was just bereft of herself and was wanting to care for this broken body that was in her tomb. You read the story of the different people that went to the tomb that morning and she seems more distraught than everyone else. Through the scriptures, it uses this fascinating phrase a number of times. It was dark. She went out looking while it was still dark. Everything was darkness. Her soul was dark. The morning was dark. Her rock had died. Mentions numerous times she was weeping. She's distraught. She runs to tell Peter the body's missing, full of despair. Her life had just fallen apart again, maybe. Her confidence had been destroyed because the man she trusted was dead and had even stole his body maybe the demons had returned maybe she hadn't really got a fresh start in life after all maybe it was just one of those fads for a while where she dared to dream she could embrace the life that God had for her but now that's gone, taken away 
She wept despair. It was still dark. Something funny about this Mary, she was courageous to the core. So even in her despair, she went looking for Jesus. Even in her brokenness, she wanted to find his body. It's only a body in a tomb she thinks she's searching for. I find it fascinating after running a church for a number of times, this desperation that comes on us in life. And people know it at different times. Listening to the comedian John Robbins talk about his kicking his addiction of alcohol and whatever, he said the thing that helped him was a desperation. He got to a point of desperation and needed help from beyond himself. Whatever it is in life, we, we hit these moments of desperation. And we tend to make one of two decisions in those moments. Because we, we, we know we're overwhelmed and we know we're broken and we know we need another chance and we don't know where to turn and we, we don't believe we can help ourselves any longer. It seems that some people turn to God and some people seem to blame God. And in the midst of it all, Mary's one of those. She goes looking for Jesus' body. She thinks his body is lost and stolen. He's not lost at all. He's risen and he's already out of the tomb. She's lost, she just doesn't know it. She knows where she is geographically, but she's lost in that moment. He knows exactly what he is doing, and she steps towards him. It says in the Bible, the sun rises, a great metaphor of what's about to happen. The angels clothed in white start to appear. The darkness starts to break. Freaky stuff, this. Remember, the cosmic order of the universe, like I said at the start, has just changed. The whole of human history now is on a different direction in life. The whole world in this moment has got a new hope and a future. Yet I find it fascinating, on this first Easter Sunday that we read about, Jesus spends an enormous amount of time seeking out individuals. You'd think you'd be a bit busy. I've got a world to tell that I'm alive. And yet he spends an extraordinary amount of time finding individuals. He searches out Mary. She thinks she's searching for his body, but he's actually searching her out. He found her in the burial garden. He was never lost. The resurrection carries this clear message. We can trust again. Second chances are real. She still doesn't recognize him at first because there's something different about his appearance. We don't understand the details of that. But also she's not expecting him to be walking around. She'd seen him crucified. Like he was deaded, you know. The, uh, he was gone. A child was asking one of their parents this week, was Jesus really deaded? Well, they'd crucified him and stuck a spear in his side. They were professional executioners. He was dead on the cross. She wasn't expecting to see him. And then he calls her name, Mary. This is the moment of transformation. You see, it's intensely personal, this Resurrection Sunday. So Jesus searches out Mary. It's interesting, on this Resurrection morning, he seems to search out the most broken of his followers on this day. The couple on the road to Emmaus, you can read that story if you want to. Downhearted. Jesus walks with them for miles on this road, chatting to them. He finds Peter, who had disgraced himself and denied his saviour, and yet he spends one-to-one -one time with Jesus on this day. Jesus finds him, and Mary Magdalene as well. The one that was in utter despair. Jesus has a, a conversation with her, but says, Mary. She thinks he's the gardener at first from the local council. You know, it's like blown her mind but as soon as he says her name she recognises him she gets it if we will still our heart long enough just for a moment either in this gathering as we're worshipping later tonight when the kids are in bed if we still our heart long enough we, you will hear him speak your name he loves you he rose from the dead to tell you you have a second chance. He wants each and every one of us to know 
He has a specific plan for your life and my life. You see, the greatness of God, this cosmic order, becomes personal in this moment. Not is God just the God of all strength, which he is. He like says, I'm your strength, Gary. Not only is Jesus the Prince of Peace, the only place we can find true peace in the whole universe, he says, Steve, I'm your peace. You get it. It's not just a cosmic event. He taps us on the shoulder, not literally, but in our heart if we still it. And he'll say your name. And he says my name. The greatness of God becomes personal. You see, death is still humanity's greatest enemy. The death rate, apart from Jesus, is still 100%. I've walked through the pyramids in Giza and walked through the tunnels. They build these massive structures. And basically there's one passageway in the midst of them and a few rooms where they've buried these dead bodies. They're empty now because they've all been raided, of course. There's no gold left in them. That's why Tutankhamun's thing was such a big deal because it was left intact and the body was there and everything. But we don't know how to deal with death these days, hoping that in some way That ancient civilization thought death meant something that it doesn't. No, they're dead. I got on the bus the other day, just this week, and I was at the back of the bus, and I was only on for a few stops, but I I saw a lady get on, didn't spot it for she was talking to the driver, she clearly had no money, and then I realized, I think I heard her say, somebody, a relative of hers had died, and could could she just get on the bus for free? And she sat on a different place, and I wish I could have said something to her, but I wasn't on for long. She was distraught in that moment because a relative of hers had died. Death is real. We get this stuff. We don't know how to deal with it in our society and our culture. It's still our greatest obstacle, but Jesus makes it absolutely clear. He wanted as many as would believe to realize he's alive because death is no longer the end. When When he walked out of the tomb, he defeated death. Physical death is still part of our existence, we know that. But eternal life starts before death, and so death for the Christian is just like, as C.S. Lewis puts it, the end of term. We just wake up in a different place. We've got a new adventure to begin. He has been to hell, taken back the keys of life and death, and walked out of the tomb to announce death is not the end. Jesus said, I am right now resurrection and life. The one who believes in me, even though he or she dies, will live. And everyone who lives believing in me dies not ultimately at all. Do you believe this? Whatever we face in life, whatever obstacle stands in our way, none will be bigger than death itself. And Jesus says, I've defeated death. I am victorious. You can join me and be part of me. Mary's despair was transformed. She got yet another second chance. As I like to say often, God is the God of a thousand second chances, not just one second chance. Jeremiah 29 says this, when you come looking for me, you will find me. This is God speaking. When you come looking for me, you will find me. Yes, when you get serious about finding me and want it more than anything else, I will make sure you won't be disappointed. This is God's decree. Like Mary, everyone can encounter God for themselves. After 40 days, Jesus ascended to heaven and sent his Holy Spirit. So we don't now see his physical body wandering around on earth, but we can know him in our hearts speaking. We can experience his presence in our ordinary lives. Most of you are going back to a home where one of the taps is leaking and one of the rooms needs some painting and the boss at work is a bit difficult. You know, most of us are leading extraordinarily ordinary lives. Don't think there's anybody famous in the room. There's just the ordinariness. We live in Arnold and around, you know, it's like fairly ordinary houses. And yet into that ordinariness, God would say, I know you, and you can know 
me. The guy off Dragon's Den, Duncan Bannatyne, I don't know if he's still on it. Is he still on it? But uh, he's not on it anymore. But he had an encounter with God a few years ago. This is what he wrote. For me, the tears came at about 10 o'clock that night. He's not a Christian. He's not a believer. He just experienced God. Gave a moment to still his heart, I guess. I went outside and found a quiet place by the side of the house. I couldn't stop the tears. My face was wet. My nose began to run. I was a mess. I had no choice but to let the tears flow. And they just kept pouring out of me and wouldn't stop. After many minutes, I began to get the feeling I wasn't alone. It was there and then that God said hello. This is what he writes in his book. I felt that I had been consumed by his presence, that something had completely shrouded and taken hold of me. It was unmistakable. I knew who had come, and I also knew why. It wasn't a spiritual thing, it was a Christian thing. And I felt I was being told, you've arrived, join the faith, be a Christian, this is it. It was profound, and I stood there stunned, considering the offer and thinking about what it would mean. I knew I wanted to keep on building up my businesses and I wanted to keep making the money. And I also knew I wanted to carry on doing all the things I wasn't proud of. I knew I was never going to be this totally Christian guy going to church on Sundays. So I said, no, I'm not ready. And God said, okay, and disappeared. God comes seeking and searching for each of us. Not in a garden outside Jerusalem now, but in our ordinary house in Arnold or Mapley or Bestwood or wherever you live. And he says, I'm here. And the question is whether we invite him into our lives. Interestingly, Duncan Bannadine has become some sort of believer in God, he says. But he's not on for this full-on Christian thing. We invite the band back. If you've trusted before, but you are now in a place of despair, I believe God says to you again this morning, you can trust me again. If you're searching for God, open your heart this morning and allow him to speak to you. It's okay to say to God, I don't know if you're real, but if you're real, will you speak to me? And just maybe you'll hear him call your name. He will speak to you of his hope. He will speak to you of his love. He'll speak to you of his purposes and plans for your life. He'll speak to you about forgiveness if you'll allow him. Most people call out to God in a time of change or a time of despair. That's what I've learned from talking to people. If you find yourself in a time of change or despair this morning, he's especially searching for you. He's especially wanting to connect and communicate with you. Allow him just come and speak to you. Allow him love on you this morning. Allow him speak to you and let you know that you're safe in his hands, that our God is good. Let's stand together. Let's worship him and invite him in.